Thank you very much. Um, before we get started, anybody in here, former active duty, currently in reserve, in training status? Okay, so I'll ask all my questions to you then. Um, <laughs> You know, starting last month, um, it was uh, 15 years since the invasion of Iraq. And we'll put, you know, pol the political aspects aside about uh, was that right or was that wrong. But what it represented was one of the major land-based conflicts our country has seen since Vietnam and has rapidly changed how we view military medicine and what we do downrange. And so as that time point started coming up, it got us thinking, you know, what, what have we learned over the last 15 years? You know, you go to conferences and people get up in the uniform, they talk about this experience and that experience. Um, but just trying to synthesize, you know, have, have we learned anything? Are we doing anything better? And where do we need to go in the future? So anything that I say is not necessarily the official policy of the Department of Defense. Um, that's my disclaimer. And I think the other thing, too, is that Nobody does anything in this field or in medicine alone, right? Um, there are many people that have deployed downrange and have their own experiences. Um, multiple folks that have taken care of patients through the system, and we're going to talk about that system as we go along. So these lessons learned are building one on top of another. So we're going to talk about military neurosurgery, give a little bit of flavor of what that is. We're going to talk about what we've learned in the management of severe TBI, spine surgery, the military complex, how we get patients out of theater, okay? And then how does this all feed back into training and what we need to do for our residents uh, uh, going forward? So again, September 11th, 2001, um, that kicked off the initial operation during Freedom where um, Special Forces went into Afghanistan. Uh, starting in October 2001, and we're still there. Um, I was there in 2014 uh, as we uh, ended Operation Enduring Freedom and went to more of a true train and assist capacity, uh, which is now uh, called Operation Freedom Sentinel. And I believe uh, um, it was during this time, too, that I think Jess Schutte came down and uh, talk to you all about his experiences down the range. And as you saw from his talk, even though we are there as a train and assist, there's still things going on. We just don't hear about it in the news as often. Um, Iraq, again, March 2003, shock and awe, followed by a uh, major land-based invasion uh, that went into uh, 2010, followed on a, by a one-year transition period for New Dawn. As I look at these dates, it's hard to believe that it's been almost 17 years that this has been going on. So um, makes you think. So military neurosurgery. So what, what is military neurosurgery? You know, we have, we do our regular neurosurgical jobs in a socialized medical system. Um, and we can sit here and talk about the pluses and minuses of socialized medicine. Um, but it's, we see patients, this is the same as any other um, hospital, treat the wide range, pediatrics to the elderly, and all subspecialties. Um, we have our administrative jobs. And if you notice, and I, 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 you know, we had the picture of uh, uh, General Powell up earlier, when you, when you get these administrative jobs, they take these pictures of you. And the rule of thumb is they say, am I supposed to smile? <laughs> right? And you look at the Marine Corps pictures, and those guys look like they're going to kill you. But so what they tell you is, Look like you know something that nobody else knows. <laughs> I, I, maybe I got it, maybe I didn't. I, I, don't, I don't know. But, <laughs> but we have these administrative jobs that we have to do um, within the military aspect. And it's, it's really, uh, unfortunately, um, it's these administrative jobs that get us promoted. Right? As a more junior rank, you're supposed to be an expert in your field in 04 and 05 and moving up to the 06 level. It's how good of an administrator you are. So administrative jobs, very similar across the board. We have uh, military training that we have to do that's required. And when we think about military training, you know, I think, oh, you know what? It's going to be stuff like this, right? I'm going to go out with a 50 cal and learn how to shoot, um, which is actually a lot of fun to, uh, to do. 
um, until at the end you have to break down that 50 cal and clean it yourself, <laughs> which is not that much fun. But I'll tell you that most of our training is not like that. Most of it is uh, online training. Like every year we have to do our Constitution Day training and take a 10 question quiz. I screwed something up on this, so I'm just going to fix it so the people that are phoning in can actually see okay. your presentation. I forgot about that, sorry. Let's see here. All right, good. Sorry to interrupt. We can look at my picture a little bit more, but um, so military, you know, it's a lot of online training. Um, I, for an upcoming deployment, I had to take SEER training, how to evade, but it's online. So they, they, they'll take, they don't put the doctors out in the middle of nowhere and tell them to come back. So it's not, it's not that cool. Um, we, you know, we have our fitness standards where we're supposed to do our PT test twice a year run a couple miles, do push-up setups, and all that good stuff. Uh, we try to mix it up a little bit, do some combat yoga uh, downrange. It's good for the mind, good for the body, good for the soul. But really when we think about what we're doing right now within neurosurgery, and I tend, to, I tend to walk, so I apologize, I've got to come back to the microphone here, is we need to be in a constant state of being worldwide deployable at any moment. Um, that can be in a role from a conflict management, humanitarian crisis, a host nation capability training. Um, and oftentimes this is going on at the same time. In Afghanistan, we're treating um, folks not necessarily injured by war, but to build relationships. We're training our Afghan partners. We're doing these different things um, to not only, and this goes back to some of the concept of the heart, winning hearts and minds, right? So it's not all about hard power, but it's also about soft power. Um, kind of along these lines, and this kind of just rapidly uh, came about, within the next two weeks, I go to the Middle East for a week for kind of a humanitarian effort, come back and then go to Vietnam for a month. So for some host nation capability training. Um, so it's exciting, it's fun. Um, a lot of different aspects though of what military neurosurgery is. So, sorry to interrupt again. Oh, no worries. Do I need to talk louder? No. Okay. Hey, somebody needs to check their microphone because you're coming over the loudspeaker here. Boucher, it looks like maybe you. <laughs> Thanks. Mute your microphone. Thank you. All right, we'll take care of it. I'm sorry about this again. No worries. Sorry. So when we think about what military neurosurgery occurs downrange, really military medicine downrange, we, we kind of break it down to about five echelons of care, okay? The first is that when someone is injured downrange, it's self-care and buddy care, right? You've got, you've got your buddy, you've got your, um, your cat tourniquet on you, so if you get hit, you're applying your own tourniquet, your buddy's putting your tourniquet on you, and then you're moving forward, okay? The next stage is that far forward surgical capability. Um, and this is where you go in, you set up a tent, you've got two operating room tables, a uh, portable sterilizer, very limited capabilities to sustain, uh, control bleeding, move on to the next level of care. And that next level, the role threes, uh, is where neurosurgery is at, okay? Probably for a couple reasons. And this is places like Kandahar, Kabul, Balad, uh, where we have CT scanners, we've got uh, more holding capacities, okay, um, and a little bit more capability and for further subspecialization. We have in the past tried to put neurosurgeons into that far forward surgical capability. Um, it didn't work real well. Um, the a combination of tools, equipment, um, what is needed just from a resuscitation process, ended up not doing much good. So that role three ended up being the sweet spot for neurosurgeons to be at. Now, once a patient is stabilized at that role three level, okay, they're evacuated up to, um, out of theater, and in this case, it's been Landstuhl in Germany, uh, where there is further capability, bigger hospital. You can hold patients for longer periods of time. You have more subspecialties there to rely on. <clears throat> and then from there, you move back to what we call CONUS, or the continental United States, 
for more definitive care, rehabilitative care. And these are places like San Antonio um, uh, for the uh, medical center there, Walter Reed um, in DC, uh, and then eventually to the VA. Okay, so as we talk about these things, I'm gonna show some pictures here to give you a sense of what we're looking at. So um, this is a picture of what the Roll 3 looked like in Iraq uh, back in the uh, mid-2000s, and this comes from uh, <clears throat> Rocco Amanda, um, who was there, and it's a tent city, right? So you're going in there, there are pallets of these supplies, and it doesn't matter who you are, you're helping put these tents up. As long as you don't have to dig that. That's, um, so, and there's a whole flow of how these patients come in from the helicopter landing pad through the trauma bay to the, to the ORs and then into the ICUs. But when you look at this, now here's a, and here's a picture of what the ICUs look, or the ORs look like there. Again, 10 on the outside, you put up these walls so you can attempt to clean it and you have a floor so dirt's not blown in. Um, most of the operating rooms have uh, the capability for uh, two surgeries to occur simultaneously. Uh, talk about communication where you got one anesthesiologist bopping back and forth there. Yeah. So, um, and again, the job here is to stabilize, live to find another day. Okay. And so it's a little different about what we, how we practice back home. Not necessarily all trauma, but we often don't think, okay, I'm going to do a little today, I'm going to come back and do a little bit tomorrow. It's a little different thought process. Now, when we move into a more mature theater, um, such as Kandahar, right? So this is the building, this is the hospital in Kandahar. Again, this was built in 2010 into 2011. We'd already been there for 10 years. So nice rocket proof, get hit, no problems. Um, ORs, pretty darn nice. Cleaning crew in there 24 seven, just constantly sweeping up dust, dirt. Um, so looks like any other uh, operating room and sometimes it was a little cleaner than uh, what I've seen back home. <laughs> but I think sometimes we have to pause and ask ourselves again, and this steps back to that bigger question, what is our role in military medicine? And should we ever be in a theater where we've got a hardened structure like this, right? Uh, now this is actually a NATO building. Uh, it's maintained, uh, uh, I think it was designed by the Germans, maintained by the Brits. Um, so fascinating, um, fascinating cooperation from a multinational standpoint. But, um, but land for this building is hard fought. There's a couple other places over here where there are still bullet holes from where um, the initial um, Army Special Forces overtook the airfield. And you look a little deeper, and there's bullet holes from where the Soviets were there. Maybe you get us thinking. But so we look at this, we're like, gosh, this is great. This is so safe. Nothing can get us. So try to be very respectful when we're over there, respecting different cultures, different religions. Don't go tearing down, shooting mosques. Um, however, I think it was 2011, 2012, a sniper crawled up there, killed a nurse walking into work. So we see these buildings, we see these things, we're like, okay, we're here to take care of patients, but we're in a war zone. So when we think about this, if you're, if you're a trigger puller <coughs> downrange, you have your rules of engagement. This is who you can shoot. This is who you should not shoot, right? In medicine, we have our rules of eligibility. And these rules change, not quite on a daily basis, but it changes based on what our mission is, right? Are we expecting a lot of kinetic activity going on so we're not going to be doing humanitarian things over the next week because we need to be ready, OK? Um, is there somebody's brother's sister's cousin who got injured that's coming in that we're going to make the exception for because the higher ups say that we are going to. And so every day we have to look, and that's the role of the, the chief of trauma. And this is Dan Gerbeau, who, uh, who was out of LA, and now he's uh, up in West Virginia running trauma up there, um, to make those decisions about who gets into the gate or not. 
And so not a, um, uh, not a fun job. We get these pages. So uh, what this tells us is we're getting a mass cow coming in. 20 alphas, that means 20 people coming in intubated, severely injured. Eight Bravo, eh, they're in between. Eight Charlies, okay, they're, they're kind of the walking wounded. Uh, the worst that we had it um, was on Mother's Day. Uh, they had just opened a new women's and children's hospital outside the gate. Um, and, of course, being Mother's Day, it was the grand opening. Um, and the <coughs> Taliban drew a, a truck bomb in and blew it up. And I was standing outside the hospital, and you could just feel this vibration. And I was like, what the heck was that? And then folks started coming in. And we had about 80 people flow in and over about a two, hour, two three-hour period there. Um, so it can, get, um, it can get crazy. But when we think about these types of injuries that we deal with, they're, they're, they're different, OK? And so when we think about blast injury, blast has multiple components. And so whether that's an IED, <clears throat> someone sticking a bunch of C4 in a remote control <laughs> device and packing it full of nails, um, to lesser extent, grenades. Um, there is a blast wave that comes out from the explosion. And the question is, is what does that blast wave do? We know that causes barotrauma. We know it to the, uh, to the abdomen, to the chest. Does it do anything to the brain? Is this what's responsible to, so for vasospasm, which we uh, have a feeling that it can contribute to? We often will be dealing with the secondary injuries, the fragmentation injuries. So this is where the projectile will come through and penetrate the body. All right, and I'll show some pictures here. Wild things that get packed into bombs that explode that will just tear into you. Um, and then the tertiary injuries, that blast wave and that explosion throws you up against the wall and the injuries you receive from there. Quaternary injuries, the thermal injuries. Uh, some people even talk about quinary injuries, which is more of the systemic inflammatory response that will occur after a blast injury. So we, we think about blast and all oh, that's an explosion, but a fascinating complex series of events that lead to multiple different ways folks can get injured. Um, so I think the other thing too, to take away, if you ever hear anybody talk right now about shrapnel injuries, they don't know what the heck they're talking about. Right, shrapnel was the type of hand grenade that they threw way back in the day. So fragmentation injury, so um, is what we use now. We have to remember that the energy that is dissipated by a round or a fragment, it's velocity. Right, the faster you make that thing go, the more damage it's going to do. So this is what really changed the difference between what we traditionally think of from civilian trauma, from um, handguns or rifles, to military-grade weaponry is the velocity. So various rounds that will show up in places. And again, how much damage does, does this lug nut do? Right? Depends how fast it was going. How deep was it buried before the explosion came up? So. When we think more about what military neurosurgery is, there is definitely this component that we need to be experts in trauma critical care, right? That's what we're trying to do. Moments notice, deploy down range, take care of our uh, soldier airmen, airmen and Marines. But that represents 10, 20% military career. So what do we do with the other 80%? Well, we're back home, right? We're taking care of various, uh, various aspects. Do we all really need to be trauma critical care trained? We probably should have some pediatric folks around. We should probably have some vascular neurosurgeons, right? Tumor guys. Um, so what has really, as we started going through and looking at this, you know, what is, what is competency for a military neurosurgeon? We, we have a great idea of what competency is for neurosurgery and now our subspecializations. But what about military neurosurgery? I think the other thing that's very tough for us, or at least it's tough for me, is giving up control of our patients. So downrange, someone comes in, you're seeing them, you take them to the operating room, 24 hours later, they're gone. 
They fly to Germany, they go to San Antonio, they get into the VA system, you never see them again. And it's hard. I tried to reach out to some folks sometimes, and it's, it's very challenging to reestablish that connection that you have because it is um, extraordinarily emotional to be in the heat of that moment, take care of somebody, and then never know how they really did. So it's, it's, it's challenging, but that's part, of, that's part of what we do. Okay, we're going to move into the management of severe TBI. Um, and a lot of this focuses on decompressive craniectomy. And why... You know, why would I choose this topic for management of TBI when we can go into a lot of different other things? It's because when we think about where we're at for neurosurgery in those roll three hospitals, we could surge, I think we, we could get up to 16 ICU beds, a couple ward beds, but it's really designed for 24 to 72 hours holding and then someone's gone, okay? So if we need to make sure that somebody is safe to get them out of theater, to the next level of care where there's more resources, more, uh, more equipment, more manpower, we need to buy time. We need to buy time to make sure that they're going to be safe, that they can get on a plane and get out of theater. And that's what decompressive craniectomies do, right? And we're going to get into, you know, who we pick and the, everything of that nature. But if we're getting waves of folks coming in, if we're getting those 80 folks coming in and 30 of them are severe, you know, we've got to make decisions on who we can help, who we can't, and if we can help them, how do we make sure our interventions are going to last? Be able to get in, get out, clear the ORs to move more people through. And that's really what, in the, in the downrange situation, what decompressive craniectomy allows us to do. Um, but when we went back and looked, if you were injured and you made it to a roll three hospital, you had a 98% chance that you were going to make it out of that hospital alive. Now, that number, I think, is, you know, people put it up there because it sounds cool, right? 98%, that sounds great. Now, there are some people there that come in and we're like, okay, you have a severe injury. We're going to keep you alive to get you home to your family because you're not going to survive this long term. So that number is slightly inflated. But what, it, but what it does speak to is the tremendous resources that we pour into every individual that makes it to that level. Right? Because there's a chance these, these folks are 18 to 24 years old, healthy, no problems, um, and their hearts will keep beating no matter what you do. Um, the other thing, too, is that, and this is where I think it's also different from what we deal with downrange to what we deal with in a civilian uh, trauma setting, is you get somebody that comes and gets shot or gets blown up, right behind them is their unit saying, Doc, what are you going to do? What are you going to do for our buddy? Or sometimes it's the guy that you just ate lunch with the day before, right? And he was out patrolling and got hit. And you realize that was the guy that was out there making sure I was safe to do my job in here. So you're pouring everything you can into, this, uh, into these uh, casualties to make sure that you can get them home to their families. And that's our primary goal, and that's, what we, that's the rules that we operate by. But it's different, right? And so if we look back, can we do a better job in our patient selection on who we operate on? Is that the right mindset to go about, right? To get somebody just to Germany just so that their family could say goodbye. Um, most of us tend to fall on the side that, yeah, it is the right thing to do. But as we'll talk about later, that may not be the right thing to do in the future, right? Because we know that the trials out there for decompressive craniectomy, maybe we save lives, but maybe we don't return people to functional levels as we would hope. But the challenge is in that downrange environment is patient selection, right? Who is, who is going to be that person that survived? Um, I had a guy that took a, uh, took a sniper around through the head, through the middle of the, uh, through the mid portion of the superior sagittal sinus. And I thought, there is no way. There is no way. Uh, but he came in a GCS-6. Um, and I said, okay, well, let's, we're going we're gonna to give you the shot. And got his sinus repaired, hematoma evacuation, required another surgery um, up in Germany. 
but he survived. Plegic on the left, battled depression for a while. His wife said, you know what? He's here, he's seen his kids grow up, this is great. That would have been the person that I looked at it, the pre-op scan and been like, no, no, I don't think, I don't think it's gonna work. I was glad I was wrong. But how do we take this data that we're generating on this side and apply it downrange? I think that's a real challenge um, and something that we haven't done as good a job at. When we went back and we look at the military literature about what we do know, well, we learned how to do decompressive craniectomies, right? Some of the pitfalls that come across it, what, what to expect when you're dealing with a penetrating as opposed to a closed injury. Um, sometimes you need to do it on both sides, um, and that's not necessarily the wrong thing to do. But what we don't have are good long-term outcomes from management of severe TBI downrange. And this is one of the better papers that we've, uh, we've come up with, where we looked at, um, we looked at folks uh, up to two years out. And what, what I think is fascinating about this is if you look at their initial GCS in the field, 6 to 8, 9 to 11, 12 to 15, two years out, they're all the same. So that means either one of two things as I, as I look at our own data. Either we're really good at taking any casualty that is survivable and bringing them back up, or that initial GCS is worthless. I have a feeling it's probably that initial GCS is worthless, but not. Um, the number of patients that we get that come in that you know are innovated sedated, paralyzed, pretty high. And one of the reasons is that our, our combat medics are extraordinarily aggressive. Extraordinarily <laughs> aggressive at getting an airway, um, getting them sedated, getting them medications on board early. Um, and so I think that that plays a large role in how these patients do long term. Um, this is a paper that um, Dr. Rosenfeld put out early on <clears throat> in the conflict, not necessarily related to what was going on in Iraq and Afghanistan, but this concept of damage control neurosurgery. And I think the trauma folks do a really good job of this, this concept that, you know, we're not, we're not going to win the war today. We're going to win this fight today. We're going to move on. We're going to come back. And so when we're downrange, can we control bleeding, get rid of the hematoma, you know, maintain uh, ICP control, limit wound contamination? I'm going to show you some pictures here a little bit later to make sure that we can move them on to do more later, knowing that we have to do more later. And that is, um, that's a hard concept sometimes, I think, for neurosurgeons to, um, to deal with because at least training up at Walter Reed and, and how I work, I'm very possessive of my patients, right? And the idea that I give up control and knowing that people are gonna have to do more later is tough, but it's part of it. It's part of what you have to do. It's damage control neurosurgery. And that's, that's what we talk a lot with our residents. And again, going through, we mentioned vasospasm earlier. Is that more from the primary blast wave? Is it from the secondary injury from the penetration? But we know that it's there. We know it's significant. It's, know it's something we have to watch out for. And what I think is very interesting about this is that the vasospasms from these traumas don't usually occur until about two weeks out. Why the heck is that? Right? Is it from a systemic inflammatory response that's kicking in from all the traumas? Is it delayed effect from a blast wave? Um, this is where we need to learn more. Um, but definitely, definitely real, definitely something that going through, especially in residency, it was like, why is this, why is this patient declining all of a sudden? Their ICP is fine. Their spasm. So when we think about once patients get back to us, it's the, re it's the reconstruction, it's cranioplasties following, uh, uh, following their decompressive craniectomies. And um, I remember early on, we were just berated by one of the surgeons who was downrange because when the patient came back up, they had their cranioplasty. Um, and within 72 hours, the patient died. And he was going off because no one should ever die after a cranioplasty. Well, what we didn't realize was that this patient was still a GCS of five and multiple other injuries, things of that nature. So 
these patients, and this is the same on the civilian side, right? These patients aren't, oh, hey, I'm here for my cranioplasty today. They're sick. They're sick patients, and there's things we have to do to manage it. Um, there's also the aspect of how do you reconstruct the skull? Because a lot of our injuries, you think about a hel having a helmet on, and I, I, I absolutely love this fact, and I can tell it now since it's 10 years later. We had put together a paper uh, going through looking at um, autopsy data on where people were getting hit, right? Where were the penetrating fragments coming in? Uh, we couldn't publish the paper uh, because they said that um, it, it would give out too many secrets, right? North Koreans could be reading the, the Red Journal that month. And, <laughs> but the thing about it was it wasn't like this was some great grand conclusion. It was if you wore your helmet, you got hit in places you didn't have a helmet on. <laughs> so a lot of the injuries that we saw, I, I kid you not, it was, um, yeah, never good to get a call from the Pentagon. Uh, <laughs> you can't publish this. Transfrontal, transorbital, transfacial. Again, not a lot of protection here. Blast comes forward. That's where a lot of the injuries are. And so how do you go about reconstructing the face um, you know, this orbital bando, extremely critical in the cranial reconstruction process. What do you need to do to go through, maybe stage it out, do a bando reconstruction first, then see what you need to do. Um, and so kind of working through this process over the years, um, kind of coming up on a way to handle these complex cranial facial reconstructions, uh, which again, something that necessarily downrange you don't think about but there are some things that we can do to make that better. Okay, we're gonna move on to spine surgery, and I'm, ten yes? In terms of, there's been a lot of interesting work, I know, like psychiatry, by comparing sort of traumatic war zones with sort of inner cities that are traditionally facing such things like that. How yeah. much correlation do you find, or, do, or how much do you find these patient populations with gunshot wounds and things like that actually correlate across the country? How much are you extrapolating? In, in regards to comparing the civilian... So you're finding in your war zones, you're trying to, like, you're trying to like look at these sort of like high impact or, or things like that. How much of that actually relates to the, what we're seeing in, in our domestic sort of... Yeah. Well? You, you saw my talk. You, you saw my last couple slides, didn't yeah. you? Yeah. No. Oh, no, no at, the very, at the very end. And so um, I, I think that one, one of the take-homes <laughs> from this that we'll go in a little bit later is I think what we learn downrange is 100% totally um, applicable to the civilian side based on the mechanism of injuries and the weaponry that's now being used. Absolutely 100%. So these same lessons, it may not necessarily be in Afghanistan, Iraq, or wherever, it could be in the next mass shooting, right? So absolutely 100% applicable. So when I get to that at the very end, you need to act surprised and be like, oh, God, that's, that's a great point. All right, let's talk a little bit about spine surgery. Um, when, when someone comes in with a spine, spinal cord injury downrange, uh, oftentimes we're not doing urgent emergent surgery to save somebody's life for that, okay? And so that creates a challenge, right? If our goal downrange is to make sure that we can stabilize somebody to get them going to the next level of care, which can take 24, 48, 72 hours to get them there. How do we apply what a lot of us are thinking is the standard of care with decompression stabilization within 24 hours after a significant spinal cord injury? Um, and so that poses a challenge, right? Because doing a, an appropriate decompression stabilization takes up time in the operating room. It requires equipment, right? Which I, I, I love the first time I go in there, I'm like, okay, what sort of instrumentation that we have down here? And they pull up a tray. You got a 45 millimeter screw, you got a six, and you're like, okay, we, we make this work. So it's not like the rep is coming in every week, hey, I just wanna know, uh, we, we got this great new screw. No, we're, yeah, we're, we're using this system that, I don't, it was from the late 90s, but um, worked. So, so we've gotta think about 
how much of our resources are we going to dedicate to a spine spinal cord injury when we may have someone coming in that's bleeding out, right? And so that, that's tough because we know that if we can get to folks early, we've got an improved chance of neurological recovery. And then this is my, my inside joke back home is, you know, not, not all spine surgeons are created equal, right? So do we expect everybody to be facile and in putting instrumentation, occiput to ilium? We also have to think about infections, right? We don't have any data necessarily, but we're going to do spinal implants here. Eh, not so good. What about here? Still as good? Um, and so it creates these challenges. It creates these challenges on what should we do. Um, because these patients don't necessarily come in always with a closed injury, right? So they could have an open penetrating injury like, uh, like this gentleman did. Uh, and this one I thought was just fascinating. I got to thank one of my Australian nurses who, who hunted this down. But this was the same fragment that, we, that I showed earlier, earlier that we pulled out of this guy's back. Um, and we're looking at this thing going, what the heck is this? Until one of the nurses snapped this picture, which they probably shouldn't have. Um, but what it, what it ended up being was on the sides of various vehicles, you had this rope system with these little metal pieces that are designed so if a rocket hits, because the rocket will explode on impact, it will hit those pieces and explode six inches before it gets to the vehicle. So the explosion is occurring just outside the vehicle to lessen the, the injury inside the vehicle. So what happened when this IED went off, it blew one of those up and caused this penetrating injury. So it's not just what gets packed in these IEDs, it's what's around in the environments, the rocks and everything of that nature. And so this is what it looks like. So all those little pock marks, all there, in-driven dirt, metal fragments, sometimes other people's bones, you got you get to curate, you dig them out, right? Because they're just going to fester, and they're going to pus out. And so, yeah, is this, we're going to instrument this guy? No way. And again, we talked about um, Staskus and what the, I think the challenges and pressure that puts on <laughs> some of us to make sure that we're doing everything we can to maximize neurological recovery downrange. Um, when we looked at folks that did have formal decompression instrumentation downrange versus doing it at a stage level such as in launch tool. Not surprising that people that had instrumentation downrange had more complications, more returns to the OR, um, and they weren't neurologically improved. Now again, 50 cases, small study. But one of the things that we've got to remember though too is that if you have an injury that occurs from a significant dissipation of kinetic force from a blast, gunshot wound, or things like that. Is it a matter of just decompressing, realigning, and stabilizing? Or has the damage already been done by the initial injury? So what we found is that if you take people that are injured downrange, maybe their Humvee flipped over because they were looking out the window at a ravine versus somebody that got blown up, if you had a war, a combat injury versus a non-combat injury downrange, you were worse off across the board. Now, again, that kind of makes sense. But so some of that urgency that maybe we see with our Asia A's, maybe those aren't the ones that we operate on. Maybe we, we fight for that OR time, we fight for that equipment for our B's, C's, and D's. Maybe we do that not necessarily for open penetrating injury, but for our closed injuries. Right? So I think it takes a thought process to go down through that, again, not all spine injuries are equal. And while we like to think that let's do everything that we can, we can't always do that because we don't have the resources. There are other things that we need to do from a military side when we're downrange to pay attention. So we notice, actually, I say we, but it was uh, Brett Friedman, who's now up at Mayo. Uh, he was in launch duel for a good chunk, 2008 to 2014, 13. 
of uh, injuries coming back. And he started noticing this pattern of fractures that he called the combat burst fracture, where we would see a, uh, uh, a burst fracture coupled by bilateral tib-fib fractures. And he was, and, and Brett's, a, Brett's an orthopedic spine guy, so he was, he was looking at this saying, what the heck, why doesn't this make sense? And so going back through, he started thinking, well, what's going on? They, they went back and talked with folks, and it was about this time they put in the new uh, MRAPs, which is the up-armored uh, vehicles. And what do you do? You sit in the MRAP, you strap in, and you're there. So when that blast goes off, hits the underside of the vehicle, all that force comes up through the legs, bilateral tip fib fractures, ends up into the lumbar spine, and then you're harnessed up top. So all the force was coming up through the bottom of the vehicle, and that's where the injuries were occurring. So because Brett had recognized this and started raising an issue, hey, there could be a problem with how our vehicles are designed that may be leading to this certain type of injury. Of course, the first response, denial. Nope, nope, it never happened. <laughs> and then, well, maybe. And then they started instituting, okay, let's put these V-shaped holes on that will deflect the blast out. And let's do a couple other design aspects. And lo and behold, this started to go away. So... I think this is a good example how it's, it's interesting as, as we try to solve one problem, we can create another. Now, some would say this is better than being blown up and dying. So it's a step, and so it wasn't necessarily blame, but it's just a, a process that we have to go through. How do we make things better? So Sir? Quick question. Do you ever see spinal cord injuries where there is no fracture or dislocation? I think it's just from the blast effect, just yes. like that brain injury. Yeah, I, I've got, um, I don't have it in this talk, but a lot of times, um, it's with sniper rounds. And so we would have, um, if someone had a through and through injury from a sniper <coughs> round, uh, just that dissipation of that energy all of a sudden. And we've got a couple of folks, because we could get MRs on them said no retained fragments. Where you're looking at it and you're just like, there's all this T2 signal change in the cord. There's no fracture. Um, I've, got another, I've got another gentleman who you saw, and it, again, it was a sniper round through the neck and then out, missed all the bony structures but he had um, a significant comminuted fracture of, I think it was T1, <coughs> just from that dissipation of energy. And so, yeah, that, it's, um, it's uh, to say impressive sounds like it's a good thing, but it's impressive, the amount of uh, destruction these things can do. So absolutely, absolutely. Um, you yeah, know, but to, to get back to a comment I made earlier, um, and, you know, Paul Klimo went back and looked at what we were doing from a pediatric standpoint downrange. And, you know, for an eight-year period, 330 craniotomy, craniectomies, another 300-some non-surgical management of pediatric head injuries. And so to go back to the question of competency, competency in military neurosurgery, <laughs> We're talking about decision-making management of spinal cord injuries, decompressive craniectomies, and all at the same time handling our pediatric population. And so I think, it's, I think it's a real challenge. I think it's a challenge for our pediatric neurosurgeons in the military to go downrange and be expected to do adult trauma. So there's a wide range of things that we've got to be ready for and be prepared to deal with. Let's talk about how we get patients out of theater. So the Air Force came up with this concept, the critical care air transport team, all right? And this is basically an ICU within the back of a C-17. Um, and if anybody's ever seen these planes, these are huge, absolutely huge. Um, but they are flying ICUs. Um, you can reconfigure the inside of these planes, stack gurneys one on top of another, um, get a couple uh, critical care docs, um, uh, critical care nurses, and take care of folks. I had the opportunity to fly on a couple of these missions, uh, bringing folks back uh, from Germany back stateside. Um, and it's pretty amazing. Pretty amazing what we can do, what we can take care of. And again, how we manage things, we've got to take this into account. The number of times that we have to tell folks, I know you're really happy. Don't pull the EVD before they get on a plane. <laughs> Don't do it. 
oh, but there, guys, if he's been in control for 20, don't, I don't care. Don't pull it out. Because you're on the back of a plane trying to put an EVD back in on somebody who's, a, who's an ICU doc, really, that doesn't work. They're just sitting there pushing mannitol, hoping that it helps. But this changed how we were able to manage patients downrange because we were able to get them out of theater to the next echelon of care quickly and safely. So I had this awesome map that was confiscated from me when I was in Afghanistan, but it kind of looked like this. So there were various, so I was down here in Kandahar, uh, Kabul it was the other at Roll 3, but throughout all of Afghanistan, there were these field hospitals, those Roll 2s. And each of the hospital had a circle drawn around it. And what that circle represented was how fast you could transport a patient within that one hour, right? We think about that golden hour of trauma, getting them, getting their initial resuscitation going. And so the goal or the idea was wherever the kinetic activity was, you needed to have them covered by a circle. So let's move those roll, roll twos around to make sure that folks are covered. And so that's often done still with the Blackhawks, with the medevac missions. Uh, the Marine Corps has been experimenting and using the Ospreys uh, to allow for vertical landing, takeoff, and getting out of there. This increases not only patient, the loading capacity, but also the duration, the distance you can travel in an hour, because they move a lot faster once they get up in the air. So that, that circle goes bigger. And this is going to be important as we, we think about things going into the future. But what this allows for is ongoing active resuscitation as soon as these folks are injured and hit medical care on their way to us. And there's been a lot of work into this as far as, as when can people fly, um, you know, silly little things that we think about now that make sense. If you've got a severe head injured patient, load them into the plane head first. Why? So when the plane takes off, their head is up, not down, and they don't get these ICP spikes that they're playing with the whole time. <laughs> Makes sense, but until somebody actually said, gosh, we should probably work on this. But a lot of different things to do to make sure that this was safe. And again, questions that come up, though, now as we look towards the future. We have enjoyed air superiority in this last conflict. So what happens when we don't have it? What happens when we can't just land a Blackhawk whenever we want to get people out? Right? Does that change what our role in our mission is? What happens if we're fighting in the Pacific? We go back to World War II, where we're just going to have floating hospital ships here and there, strategically placed. So our ability to evacuate patients safely changes the paradigm on how we need to take care of patients downrange. Right? And maybe in the future, we need not to have a 24-hour holding capacity, but be able to 7 to 14 days. And so these are the things that we have to think about and plan for going into the future. I'm gonna whip through military training here uh, just real quickly because I realize I've, I've been talking for a while. But what I see my job is uh, up at Walter Reed for the program is essentially how do we pass along the lessons learned of these conflicts to the next generation, right? Because when we think about military medicine, especially military neurosurgery, a lot of the commitments are four years. That's about the, the, the life cycle of a lot of our docs. And so if it's not practice, it's lost. And four years later, it's, it's gone. And so by creating our training program so we're, we're, we are meeting the requirements of the RRC and we're doing everything that we need to do to train neurosurgeons, we need to go above and beyond. We need a military unique curriculum that's going to integrate these lessons that we've learned over the last 15 plus years that will provide a foundation to make decisions going forward in the future. Um, so, you know, we go through and, and think, you know, well, what percentage of our curriculum should be dedicated towards military neurosurgery? How much time should we, and effort, should we place on that versus pediatric neurosurgery versus vascular neurosurgery? And how do we work in these various aspects to make sure that we're getting those skills translated down to our residents? Um, I'm going to briefly just go through this. Um, Try to do, understand this a little better. Uh, 
doing a literature search. 327 articles right now in the, in the literature related to military neurosurgery. About 116 of those are in the, what I call the modern period um, since 9-11, uh, uh, kind of breaking them down in different categories. But to kind of help not only our own residents and ourselves, but also our reservists, uh, folks that may be thinking about coming on active uh, duty, um, we created a um, kind of a neurosurgery uh, military um, reading list that will go through and so people can pull up articles. It's, it's free, it's online, open to the public. So basically, okay, what, what do we know about cranial injuries? What, what's the literature show? So people have a ready reference. In addition, the uh, Army Surgical Research, the Joint Clinical Practice Guidelines, these are lessons learned that folks have ready access to. There's, there's actually an app for that. There's an app for everything um, that we can pull up and we can look at. Okay, how are we supposed to deal with severe head injuries downrange? How are we supposed to deal with spine injuries downrange? And again, a lot of these aren't necessarily written for neurosurgeons, but they're written for the folks that may be off by themselves. How, what am I supposed to do with this? I tell you what, the number, it, it, what, was, what was great about this is when I was, when I was there, they, um, they basically said, I said, had some kid come in with a mastoid injury or a man, it was mastoid, mandible. They're like, well, Chris, you, you handle everything from here up, right? That's close to the brain. Sure, why not? So I don't know how many eyeballs I took out because um, I was the only thing closest to an ophthalmologist there. Right? So you go back to these guidelines, you, you know, you do the quick study, you, you see that joke on, on the, uh, on the uh, internet about looking up YouTube on how to do a video. If you're the only one there and you need a refresher how to do uh, a nucleation because of a zero air eye injury. But that's what these guidelines are for. You know, how to manage a blast injury with TM ruptures. I'm not an ENT doc, but let me go back and look. So that's what we try to do. So when we look at what I see my job as being in, this, in the residency program up at Walter Reed is training the military neurosurgeon, right? But we only train one a year. So we are extraordinarily reliant on folks that are in civilian training programs, reservists, to fulfill the needs that our military um, requires us. But we have to have some way of teaching these military unique lessons because it is unique, right? And this goes back to Colonel Sperling and Admiral Craig at the end of World War II creating these neurosurgery programs within the military, saying military neurosurgery is unique based on the lessons from World War II. We should train for this. And when Cal Early got back from Vietnam, the Navy still didn't have a training program and said, you know what, this is kind of some different stuff that we're seeing. We should really train folks for this. And that's how the Navy program got started. Now, we look at going into the future, 2018 National Defense Authorization Act. Everything that we do is mandated by Congress. This is a focus on readiness and, you know, what does readiness mean? Who defines the standards and how are we going to achieve it? Um, I think there are going to be challenges that we're going to be faced going into the future. And ultimately, how do we achieve military neurosurgery competency, right? <clears throat> while you're on active duty, while you're in training, how do we incorporate these lessons learned so that when you come out on active duty or you're a reservist that's activated, you've got these tools already, already there. And this is where I think you guys come into play, right? So the Surgical Critical Care Initiative, Joint DOD Civilian um, uh, study, basically letting us take information from trauma so that we can then apply it to the situations that we need it. And all of us need it to make things better. Um, so I appreciate the fact that Emory is a part uh, of this program. I think it's critically important as we are entering a period, hopefully, where we are in between conflicts for a prolonged period of time, where we can continue to gather data so that if and when the next conflict occurs, we're going to be ready. We're not going to take any steps back, and we're going to be able to move forward. So I think this is where our military-civilian partnerships are critical. Okay, so what have we learned? 
Military neurosurgery, I think, is unique. Um, but this, wasn't, this isn't anything new. This came out of World War II. It came out of Vietnam. It's coming out of this conflict. There are aspects that we need to make sure that we're ready for. All right, so this is where you have to act surprised. So lessons from military neurosurgery, you know, they're transferable. Maybe they're not applicable. But, I mean, how many times do we have to turn on the news to see AR-15 used, blast used? So these lessons are 100% applicable. I think that there are the unique aspects of military neurosurgery needs to be incorporated in training at the level of residency and level of the reserve, and then continually refreshed when folks are on active duty, because you just never know when you get the call and when you need to go, okay? And the key is, is how do we make sure that we don't keep recreating will and learning the lessons that we've already learned? We have to balance between our subspecializations, our fellowship-based training, and being military neurosurgeons, okay? The military needs subject matter experts in certain areas, but we all have to have a baseline level of competency in military neurosurgery. We know that decompressive, decompressive craniectomies can save lives in a downrange environment, but can we do better with better patient selection, right, to achieve better outcomes? We talked about instrumented spine surgery needing to be balanced with the risks of uh, involved in the potential for neurological recovery. And like anything, when we're dealing with downrange, in order to be successful, we have to understand the operational and tactical environment that we're dealing with, especially when treating trauma. Okay? And I think that's it. I'm just over an hour. I apologize for running over, but uh, happy to answer any questions that uh, folks might have. Yes? Has the U.S. takes more of a training and assisting role in Afghanistan? Um, how are you approaching sort of passing on this knowledge to the Afghan military, Afghan government, when they likely have more limited resources? Right. So I think this is one of the challenges, not only in that situation, but also in any humanitarian mission. And I'm kind of blurring humanitarian missions into this. Because you have to take into account what that the customs, cultures, beliefs, um, resources are in the country that you're dealing with, right? It's extraordinarily unfair for us to apply U.S. standards of care to, uh, to a population that does not have the infrastructure to support that, right? How we manage cervical spinal cord injuries here, very different than in Afghanistan. No rehab, no long-term vent support, right? Financial sub uh, resources available. So I think one of the key things that we have to do is not impose our own values and our own beliefs and thoughts on a population that may not be able to support it and may not agree with us. So it's about communicating, making sure that basic um, concepts on treatment are, are discussed, trained on, so that, yeah, injuries that occur that fit within a population's um, support in catchment, if you would, that they can treat, deal with them, and successfully uh, move on, as opposed to <coughs> trying to do more with something that we know would fail. Sir? In, in places like those, uh, like Kandahar, we have that third level hospital in launch school. Do you ever, in, in active war, have we ever not had enough neurosurgeons at those facilities? You know, are, are we in need of more neurosurgeons? Or? So, Sanjay Gupta helped out. Yeah. He did. He did, yeah. <laughs> so I think I think it's a it's a tough question to answer because especially right now, we are at we are at a state where we and I'm gonna use the army for an example, because the Navy of course does everything perfectly. <laughs> so the army in the mid two thousands had a tremendous drop off on the number of neurosurgeons that they had in the active duty ranks. And in fact, uh, up into like 2010, I think they had three. And so all the downrange support things, were, our downrange missions were being uh, covered by the Air Force and the Navy. So the Army, and I think very appropriately so, said, we need to train more neurosurgeons. But how long does that take? Seven, eight years? So now, Army's doing great. They've got all these neurosurgeons, but they needed them eight years ago. So I think it's a real challenge because our needs 
fluctuate, can fluctuate dramatically. I think what we have right now, we can do the job. Four or five years from now, when maybe some of us are going to be 20, 22 years in and are going to retire and then move on and things go down, numbers go down, depending on what the conflict situation is. So it's, it's a dynamic question that I think is it's, it's very hard to answer. Have there been times in the past? Absolutely. Absolutely. Next question.